This is Maru. I identify as queer in general. Um, that, that would be my first response if I'm having a conversation with someone and we're, we're discussing this, <laughs> this topic. Uh, more specifically, lesbian and gender fluid-ish. Maru's family is originally from Portugal, from a small town called Maia, just north of Porto, which is where I met up with her during my trip to Portugal in September 2021. She just moved back here after having spent many years living in San Francisco. Yeah, so I lived in San Francisco, which is a queer mecca. <laughs> You don't think twice about looking queer or, you know, walking down the street with a partner and holding hands or even some mild PDA, right? Public displays of, displays of affection, anything like that. You don't question whether that person looks queer or not. Chances are they are queer because it's San Francisco or they're open to it, at least. It's a very unique place because it was that to the extreme, right? And I don't think that there is any place in the world that has that concentration of uh, self-identified queer people. In fact, the town right across the bridge from San Francisco called Oakland, California, recently was said to have the largest population of queer lesbian couples in the world. Right, so, <laughs> so this is normal. Queer parties, queer bars, queer clubs, queer events, it's just everywhere. But then the pandemic hit, and Maru had to move back to the place where she spent her teenage years, Portugal. I hadn't lived here in like 17 years, quite a while. Um, and I, it was nowhere on my mind that I was coming back to Portugal. That did not exist. It was nowhere on the horizon. And then all of a sudden, it was this imperative. In, in terms of being queer, I already knew that it was going to be a bit of a shock, to say the least coming from San Francisco of all places to here. Not that, that I can say this is necessarily the most hostile place in the world to queer people. It's not by any means. And in fact, Lisbon, for instance, has been named as one of the most queer friendly destinations for vacation in Europe and so on. And, and I see that, I recognize that. There are a lot of cultural things that do not translate from the US to Portugal and specifically in terms of queer identity. That has been really tough. So what does the queer phobia look like in Portugal in Maru's experience? I think part of a distinction to make is, and this is not an excuse because this is definitely an issue for queer people, but the one thing is, you know, being specifically hostile towards someone who has a queer identity because they're queer. Another thing which I think is much more pervasive in this country is just finding things and people odd because they're different. We also need to remember Portugal used to be a country of immigrants, people leaving the country um, to go elsewhere to make a living and a life. And now it's the opposite. There are a ton of people coming in right? and there's a lot more diversity from all over the world. And so what that does is it brings a lot of diversity, which in the Portuguese mindset translates to difference, right? And we're not used to difference. And so you'll often get people staring, <laughs> you know, in really uncomfortable ways. It definitely bugs me, you know, and, and I think that's probably the most prevalent sign of things that as a queer person you might take as being rude or annoying or you know, even a sign of, of, of something possibly going wrong and, and uh, progressing to something less than polite happening. Um, but you just don't know. It's, it's very ambivalent and it's very hard to read people, how they'll, they'll react. That's been the, the most difficult part for sure, by far. It's knowing that I'm not quite sure how people are gonna take it, even in casual ways. And so I've, I've probably been toned down a bit in terms of how I dress. Not that I'm a crazy dresser, you know, super eccentric to begin with, but I will think twice before putting on a t-shirt with a pride flag, I'm sorry to say. And I, you know, I sometimes I wish I was one of those people like, I don't give a fuck, <laughs> you know, I want to do whatever I want. But 
I just don't know. I'm still acclimating to the country. Um, and you know, you hear things, things that happen, uh, not so pleasant things sometimes. And I, you know, I, I need to preserve my bodily integrity above all. The fact that Maru is holding back is bothering her for many different reasons. On the other end of this, this conversation is the fact that I, I feel like I need to be a little more of that queer unicorn specifically for younger people who might be feeling these things you know I, I don't I don't want to see young people feeling like they're alone in the world specifically if they're trans or gender non-conforming because they never see anyone that looks like them or anyone willing to show hey I'm queer and I just like to live my life I like to have a job I like to hang out with friends I just like to be like anyone else in the world, right? Queer or not. And it's really important to me, having worked with, with kids, that they know that. And, and the main way that they know that is by us showing them, right? It's not telling them, it's showing them, right? Showing that there can be healthy queer romantic relationships between people, right? That we have healthy communication skills, that it's okay to talk about these things, that it's okay to wear uh, a shirt with with a pride flag and so on and so forth. So th these are the kinds of things that I'm thinking about and working through on a daily basis. If you only look at the laws, Portugal seems like a pretty good place to be LGBTQIA+, though. In terms of legislation, it's super, super progressive. But I think in, in, our, in our daily lives, it, it, it's, it's hard because there isn't conversation about it, right? So while you can go and have gender affirming surgery, you also don't have conversations about it with people. People also have no idea, for the most part, that people understand the difference between sex and gender or personal gender identity. And so that creates this huge schism, right? Because if there is a difference and, and we're noticing and we're able for the first time in history almost on, on a cultural level to say this is not who I am, this is who I am, this is what I want to do in order to conform to what is true to me, but you can't have a conversation about it. In a way it's almost like, I don't know, but, it, but, it, but it's a loss. For me it's a, it's a sense of loss. It's like, well I can m make the physical changes, but if I can't have the relationships that go along with that, to talk about it because it's so taboo, then I, I feel like I'm back at square one. You know, I'm, I'm very preoccupied with, with people who are younger, who do feel like that's their situation. Um, living in a culture where there's no room to talk about difficult things, for the most part. You know, I might meet a friend here or there like, oh yeah, I have a great relationship with my parents and I can talk about anything, but that's not the norm. That's not the cultural norm. So that's difficult for me because on, on the one hand, I'm very hopeful. Um, oftentimes progress in this, in this culture, specifically the cultural process, the social psychology within the culture progresses because it's almost dragged, so to speak, by the legislation. And that's good, okay, we're, we're making progress. But for me in particular, maybe because I'm a person who is very focused on communication and verbalizing how I feel and working through ideas and feelings in a verbal way, it's really difficult that you don't have the dialogue to accompany that. Something that gives Maru hope has been reading up on LGBTQIA history in Portugal. I am learning a little more about queer history and, and queer activism that has existed since the end of the dictatorship, so since 74, which if you think about it for Portuguese history is remarkable. It's remarkable that that early on there was a group of people who already thought, wow, you know, we need to mark our presence here. We need to let, let people know that we're here. I, I don't think that the majority of people in Portugal know that. I, I think probably even the queer community doesn't know that for the most part. But nonetheless, it's very comforting to know that that, that, that has existed, that we have history here as, as a community. And, um, and that things are slowly changing, you know, that there are places like Aveiro, which uh, seem to be really cool and very open and have all kinds of folks and have just a very chill vibe to it. I uh, feel hopeful, I feel good about this time here and, and discovering a little more about my own country, particularly as it relates to queer identity.
So is Portugal a place that queer people should visit or avoid, according to Maru? I hope people do come and check out the country. And I hope that they're unafraid to be themselves. And just know that there are plenty of people. Interestingly, this happens a lot in the interior. You'll meet people that if you just go up to them and say hi, you know, you'll start a conversation, they'll probably invite you into your home, into their home and <laughs> for a meal. And, it, and it's really just about the person that you are. There isn't much care for social hierarchies or, oh, this person looks like they have a lot more money than I do. Or People are also just curious. And if sometimes the curiosity can seem weird because they stare at you, sometimes it's genuine just curiosity and people are really nice. And I think that's a really hopeful sign. And, and I hope that more people will come to experience that. To answer the initial question, how queer friendly is Portugal? How queer friendly is Portugal? I'd say on the world scale, it's about average. <laughs> it's about average. Mm -hmm.